now I invite Dr. Debbie Long, um, who is a PICU nurse at the Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane. Uh, Debbie completed her PhD in 2012 and co-leads and is the nursing lead for Pediatric Critical Care Research Group at, in Queensland. Debbie currently manages a program of research around sedation, delirium, and long-term long outcomes in critically ill children. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, thank you. Essentially, the title of my talk, the short version of that is um, uh, a neurodevelopmental sub-study nested uh, neatly within a larger trial looking at the role of nitric oxide during bypass and open heart surgery. Um, essentially today I'm um, representing a larger group um, of um, cardiac units within Australia and New Zealand. So just um, to set the scene, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about the larger nitric oxide trial. And I kind of feel like I'm preaching to the converted here because everyone in the room pretty much would know about the study. But essentially it's a large NHNMRC funded randomised controlled trial being conducted in all the major cardiac centres in Australia and New Zealand. And um, we're also about to take on a large cardiac centre in the Netherlands. Um, as I mentioned, um, the primary um, aim of the larger nitric oxide study is to look at the role of uh, gaseous nitric oxide, so we're used to in ICU delivering um, nitric oxide which is inhaled through um, mechanical ventilation. It's the same setup essentially but it runs through the cardiopulmonary bypass machine um, in children undergoing um, open heart surgery. So this is uh, in children who are under two years of age. The primary outcome of the main study is uh, ventilator free days and um, has several secondary outcomes, specifically around a low cardiac output state, mortality, and the use of ECLS, and also a composite measure of those, so if they get um, or reach any one of those individually. And obviously, as a uh, nested sub-study, um, neurodevelopment is um, also a secondary outcome of that. Um, on a positive note, this study will um, at its completion be the largest paediatric cardiac surgical randomised control trial. And um, hopefully if um, we see the results that we expect to see, that the implementation of nitric oxide um, used during bypass will be fairly quick to implement <coughs> after the results of the study come out. So from a translational point of view, um, we remain quite hopeful about that. So why did we add neurodevelopment in as a sub-study or as a secondary outcome? Um, well, it's quite well known that children with congenital heart disease are at increased risk of neurodevelopmental disabilities. They're a known at-risk group. And um, obviously, um, early neurodevelopmental delay can have lasting negative impacts on education and lifelong learning, um, learning and earning potential and also quality of life. And usually the main role around detecting neurodevelopmental delays in these children is um, early identification and early intervention. Um, there's lots of um, evidence in the literature about um, that perioperative management can impact brain development and long-term neurodevelopment. So that's their management in terms of their um, surgical correction. But there's lots of risk factors for children um, with neurodevelopmental delay and also in this cardiac um, cohort. Um, they're modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors and they tend to fall into the patient perioperative and post-operative domains. And I guess, you know, why neurodevelopment? And we've seen lots of significant improvements in our surgical and anaesthetic techniques in that perioperative area but we've not really seen the same gains um, demonstrated in neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so uh, my thinking and our thinking is this, can um, the role of nitric oxide shift um, these developmental delays and <coughs> could we detect a, a difference um, in neurodevelopmental outcomes? So with this in mind, the aim of this particular nested sub-study was to assess the pre-intervention neurodevelopmental profile of children recruited to the study and explore some risk factors. So in this instance, these risk factors are non-modifiable risk factors at the, at the patient level. So entering into the study, what do they bring with them um, that already puts them at um, risk of developmental delay? 
currently within the study, we assess for neurodevelopment using the ages and stages um, screener um, at baseline and at 12 months post-intervention. And given that the children can be up to two years of age, um, they're not all neonates. The ages and stages, as I mentioned, is a screener. It's not a full um, neurodevelopmental comprehensive assessment. And in 1,325 children, that would be quite cost and resource um, prohibitive. The, the screener measures five domains, communication, fine motor, gross motor, problem solving, and personal social. And we use it in children as low as one month of age and up to five years of age. Well, that's um, what its validity is for. And on each of these domains, they score between a range of zero to 60, 60 indicating um, above the cutoff and um, better neurodevelopment. Um, the cutoffs that are provided by ages and stages are norm reference, and it's got uh, good sensitivity and specificity, and it's also um, got good published data used in the, in the cardiac cohort. So um, for this study, I'm specifically looking at their neurodevelopmental outcomes at baseline. So this is before, as a child has entered into the study, but before they've even received the intervention, what do they look like neurodevelopmentally? And in this um, study, we've defined de developmental delay as below the cutoff, so that's two standard deviations below the mean um, put out by ages and stages on two or more domains. Um, so we've just used descriptive, univariate and multivariate um, level statistics here. Um, so to date, there have been close to 400 children recruited into the study. The study started um, just over 12 months ago. And um, of those, 249 have completed ages and stages um, questionnaires. And these are parent um, reported or parent completed questionnaires. Clinicians can do it, but it, in most of the cases, these are parent reported. Um, as I said before, you can't use the ages and stages in children under one month of age, although they are included in the study, and about a third of the children um, in the cohort to date have not been able to have an ages and stages at baseline. So if we take the children who did have a completed ages and stages um, and just have a look at some of their characteristics, um, on average, they are about seven months of age and um, had a gestational age of 38 weeks and about three kilos of gestational birth weight. About 17% had a previous bypass and 19% had a diagnosed congenital syndrome on entry into the study. Um, a lot of the uh, cardiac neurodevelopmental longitudinal papers um, exclude the congenital children, but because the primary outcome around this paper is not neurodevelopment, it's around um, ventilator-free days, these children aren't excluded um, from the main trial. From a um, pathophysiology on entering into the study, so this is, is an after correction, but prior to the correction, um, majority of the children are biventricular. And just as an idea of what sort of surgeries they were heading in for, um, most of them were RACS2 or RACS3, but a, a nice even spread. So if we have a look at the ages and stages, and remember I mentioned that there were five different domains, and the usual um, cutoffs are below the cutoff. That's two standard deviations. Close to the cutoff is one standard deviation, and then there's above the cutoff. And what we find is that around the 20% of children um, fall below the cutoff neurodevelopmentally, but in the gross motor, it's up to 40%. And this is not that different from um, the general um, reported. Um, developmental outcomes in children in cardiac studies. Um, we do find in the younger ages it is the gross motor that stands out the most. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So these are two standard deviations below the mean. And remember I said that to define um, neurodevelopmental delay in this study, we said you had to have that on two or more of those domains. Um, and that um, was about 38% of children had below the cutoff on more than two domains, or two or more domains, sorry. Um, so just to have a look at, well, what do these children look like in um, relation to the um, normal population? 
And so I've calculated Z scores for those. Um, and just to make that rather um, gruesome looking table a little bit easier. Essentially, we take the reported means um, used to generate the ages and stages scores, and then we um, take away our means from our population and um, divide it by the standard deviation. And essentially, what this data is telling us is that this population, this cohort in this study, perform on average about one standard deviation below what um, the reference norms are. Um, and in particular, I mentioned that I would sort of come back to the gross motor. It, it, it seems to be around that nine or ten month mark that um, where there's um, bigger deficits um, in this cohort. So just looking at some of the baseline characteristics that I uh, mentioned before and looking at what has a relationship between this developmental delay. And several factors um, came out, and that was gestational age, gestational birth weight, gender, and congenital syndrome. So the presence of a diagnosed congenital syndrome before entering into the study. There was no significant difference in whether they'd had bypass previously. Um, they were allowed to enter into the study um, having had previous bypass. Um, and pathophysiology, there was no difference as well. And using a uh, logistic regression and looking to see that which were the most significant predictors in there, um, three out of the four stayed in, so birth weight uh, dropped out. So remember I said before that 30% of the cohort were neonates, and is there something different about these neonates? And I didn't want to confuse you with them all before, so I've actually pulled out the, the neonates. So this is exactly the same sort of baseline characteristic table that I showed you before. Um, the second column is the main um, cohort that I talked about, and then we've got this 113 neonates. And um, there was only a difference there in terms of their age on entry to the study. Obviously, if they're neonates, they'll all be, um, in this case, under one month of age. And the only other difference there is the congenital syndrome. And the reason for that is that in entry to the study under one month of age, often they haven't had a congenital <coughs> syndrome um, diagnosed, which is a really important fact, given that congenital syndrome has actually come up as a significant factor for developmental delay prior to entering into the study. And I'll get to that. So um, we've been able to confirm that the nitric population is similar to the broader cardiac um, open heart surgery cohort, um, and that developmental delays are present prior to surgery and the study intervention. A lot of studies have looked at risk factors and patient risk factors um, in work and neurodevelopmental follow-up post-intervention, um, but this is specifically at entry to the study. Gestational age, gender and congenital syndromes are risk factors and confounders, and that's really important for us in conducting a larger randomised control trial because it helps us prepare for statistical analyses and looking at confounders um, around neurodevelopment. Although the numbers are small, um, again, it does prepare us instead of waiting until the end of the study. Another difficulty is the ages and stages is a screen. It's not a direct um, comprehensive assessment, and we're looking for further grant funding to, to do full neurodevelopmental follow-up on these children at various different age points. And there's a whole other debate about what time points, what um, tools to use, what domains to measure. Um, and specifically, I wanted to sort of come back to the congenital syndrome. The way that we currently collect our data in the study is that we um, ask the parents to look at the notes on entry into the study. Um, and up until we did this, we didn't actually recheck again with the parents. So this um, look through to look at baseline um, risk factors has emphasised to us that at the 12 month follow up, we really need to go back and check again whether a congenital syndrome has been diagnosed during that period. Because particularly with that neonatal cohort, it often um, hasn't been documented or reported yet. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? Thank you, Liz. Yes. So, in terms of you know, your findings, <coughs> will you then advocate to the broader system to or the Chester Run operate team for intervention? Because neurodevelopment services are set quite fully funded across paediatric services. Is there a, a goal to Or will they just be confused with the general population with the broader knowledge that we need to get in 
think that's a, a, a really important question because um, my understanding across all the different sites, and we're just sort of starting to nut this out now because we're starting to do the 12-month assessments, is what to do if you detect delay. And of course, you know, the ethical and the moral thing to do would be to refer them for intervention because we know that early intervention is the best. Um, but the, the level of um, screening and early intervention varies from site to site and state to state. And I know that in the background there's been a broader national and even international collaborative going on trying to sort of get at what is the best um, business as usual for the cardiac cohort. Um, I can't overemphasise the amount of sort of key stakeholder negotiations um, that we've had to have. And in addition to these assessments, they have got their screening pathways going on in the background of which the clinicians, meaning cardiac surgeons and cardiologists, are very mindful that they don't want our processes to trump their processes. Um, so it's a, a very fine balance, delicate negotiating with, if we find this, what would you like us to do? So give you an example, in Queensland, um, if we were to do Bailey's assessments on all children at um, 12 months, it would actually trump the clinical pathway that the children are on. Um, and th But the clinical pathway is screen first if it flags and you detect um, um, some sort of delay, refer on for a further full assessment. But if we trump them with a full assessment right out of the um, ballpark, we're interfering with how that rolls out in, in business as usual. The other thing is that we only follow up children who are, have open heart surgery under two, 12 months of age, whereas this study goes out to two years of age. So what do you do if some kids fall on a pathway and some kids don't? And then do you then go and provide a further? So we have to sort of do this in mind of the, the bigger things that are going on out there and, and, and not just sort of remain in our own little bubble about what we think is the best thing to do. Sorry, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Thank you, Debbie. In the interest of time, we might take the next few questions at the reception. <laughs> so I'll invite the uh, last speaker, Kim. Yes, yeah, so our last speaker in, in this session is, is Kim Morris, who's a clinical nurse educator in the paediatric intensive care unit down at Royal Children's in Melbourne, and where she's been for the last 12 years. And uh, 